I don't think there's anything that highlights that, uh, that truth or that understanding more than if you return to your, your, uh, your college and uh, go to a football reunion, which I did on Friday, and I was reminded over and over and over again who the old was, okay? And I just took so much joy in the fact that the new has come. Um, you know, guys reminded me, you know, Reed, you were, you were voted least likely to be a pastor, um, <laughs> which uh, is true. And, you know, I think we need reminded of that time and time again. And it's okay to think about who you were, not as a way to beat yourself up, obviously, but as a way to know where God has brought you. It was just, uh, it was glorious. And it, it is every day when you continue to think about that. So I thank God for who I was and now who I am. Amen is right. All right, the, the title for today's uh, sermon, I'm excited about this. Not that I'm not excited every week, but it's not a, a great revelation that I'm, uh, I'm giving here, but it is a teaching, and it's, uh, it's a reminder to all of us. The title is The Essence of Our God. And, and that's what I want you to grasp today is the full essence of who our God is. And so hopefully you'll have a little bit more understanding of God after, uh, after this sermon. You know, in our belief and our faith, God is represented in what we call three distinct persons. Obviously not people persons, but beings. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And he yet, he remains the one true God. Now, I can say with confidence that's a concept that my limited understanding has not fully grasped as of yet. Um, <laughs> I can also say with confidence that God does not exist in the three forms that the book The Shack portrays him. Anybody read the book The Shack? Okay, I see a few hands. The rest of you, don't read it. <laughs> uh, see, because I'm betting my life that God the Father is not an African-American woman named Elusia, which is how he's portrayed in that. Um, you got to be careful into buying into any man's interpretation of God's existence, however credible it may seem or believable it may sound to you. Here's what I believe. If God thought it was so important for us to know exactly how he exists as our triune God, that our saving faith would depend upon it, he would have spelled it out clearly in his word. He didn't. What is in the word is this. Now we see only reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. We see only in part now, something we just have to understand. Because as mortals, we aren't capable of processing the full essence of God. Try processing this next statement that I'm about to make. You ready? God has no origin. Wow. There's never been a time in eternity past when God did not exist. <laughs> He's always been. Everything we know as mortals, humans, has a beginning and it has an end. Not God. No beginning. And hallelujah, no end. The first four words of Scripture. In the beginning, God. Mm -hmm. Crazy, isn't it? I mean, when you let your mind really go to that place, it's like, how in the world is this possible? And once you fully grasp the truth, the existence of God and the existence, really, of us, for that matter, becomes mind-boggling. And you realize that you and God are like eons apart. Isaiah wrote, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts, declares the Lord. Sometimes we just have to say that and leave it right there. 
The one thing that we do know from Scripture about God is this. God is spirit. I mean, those are Jesus' words, and after all, he would know, right? But does that truly help you understand the essence of God? All through Scripture, God's essence has appeared to man in a myriad of ways. In a burning bush, in a pillar of cloud, a pillar of fire. But also, God appeared to Elijah in a still small voice. He wrestled, actually, with Jacob. And that would be something I strongly recommend against. Once God appeared as the fourth person in a fiery furnace, God even spoke through a donkey. (laughs) Scripture also records that on eight different occasions during the Old Covenant times, God took on human-like form, including that of angels. On a number of other occasions, God's appearance was verified as an undefined form, or his identity was made known through his voice and voice alone. None of these recordings of God with man give us enough information so we can easily picture God accurately in our minds. Although we try, don't we? (laughs) I mean, we all try. White hair, white robe, big staff, sitting on a big throne. You know, while that may comfort us to picture God that way, nothing in the Bible indicates he's anything like that. As a matter of fact, it indicates he's not like that. I can tell you this, that God has supernaturally preserved his word for 3,500 years so that his people can know one thing, and that is regardless of his form, regardless of his essence, he is God, and he alone is worthy to be praised. But he has also allowed us to know why he created all of this the way in which he did. And he gave us his word. He gave us his word so that we may know the history of our faith, but also so that we may know our future as well. But he never gave us a vivid picture of himself, that is, until Jesus came. And even through Jesus' coming, we're not to assume that God looks like the man Jesus, although we don't really know what Jesus looked like either, except that he was not some very impressive-looking person. Now, as I mentioned a moment, ago, a moment ago, Jesus told us that God is spirit. And his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. Spirit in the Greek is pneuma. And it means a simple essence devoid of physical matter. Now, that really doesn't allow us to put a face or a body, for that matter, to his name. And that is for good reason. God never wanted anyone to craft an idol after him. That's left for the Baal worshipers. That's, those are the ones that do that. Take a look at Romans. They exchange the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being. Now, if we, you know, if we craft an idol, it's going to look like us. They exchange the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. And that's perfectly okay. We don't have to have a snapshot of God's face or his form either in order to worship him. And we shouldn't even spend time worrying about what God looks like or even how God exists. It should have no bearing on our faith whatsoever. You know, through the years, I've had some non-believing friends come up to me and tell me, you know, if God would just come down and show himself and do something really miraculous, then I would believe Would you? I doubt it. That's just a poor excuse for not believing. If God would just do a miracle, stop it. God doing a miracle. Michelle and I just had our fifth grandbaby born this week. And this little being came into this world as a miracle. And let me tell you something. There is no greater miracle. Nothing speaks more loudly of a godly miracle than the the miracle of birth. Take a look. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
What are you doing, little girl? Hmm? <laughs> you can't get tired of watching that. <laughs> Come on. A miracle, right? A beautiful, precious, living, breathing life. Every part intact, birthed through the womb of its mother. And from the moment of conception, that whole process is all God. And it's one of the main reasons that he created us, right? To bring forth life. This miracle happens more than 370,000 times every single day. By saying we need to see God or some proof of God before we can believe in God is really an oxymoron. You think that? Here's why. Because to fully believe in God, one has to have faith. And faith, by definition, is the opposite of proof. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Actually, by you saying you have to see evidence of God before you believe in Him means that you will forever be incapable of believing in Him. Here's what Romans tells us. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power, and His divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people is, are without excuse. Faith is the full substance of our belief. Not faith in proof, not faith in, in, in intelligence, no. Faith and faith alone. Plus, by saying that you need proof of God, well, that's not really going to endear God to you anytime soon. Because in Hebrews, it's, it's written, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. Knowing God and loving God and trusting God comes by believing in God. Believing without proof. That's the very definition of faith. And faith is the only vehicle that can save your soul. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is one of the reasons why many intellectuals aren't people of faith. Everything in their lives is based upon them fully comprehending it before they're going to believe it. Take the New Testament Jews and the Greek scholars. Paul understood them pretty well, for he wrote this. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Has, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? These are all rhetorical questions. Jews demand miraculous signs before they believe. Well, Greeks, they look for wisdom before they believe. But we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. The stumbling block to not only non-believing Jews, but to Gentiles as well, is that God has not, does not, nor ever will operate by man's standards. No one has ever succeeded in putting God in a box and then labeling him. What makes sense in our limited capacities to understand may have nothing to do with the mind of God. You realize that. The world wants to reason God out. They do. They want to be able to explain him with logic, justify his actions with reasoning. But you realize God is illogical, right? Illogical. There's nothing about God that's logical. Man wants God to operate much like we do. But thankfully, God and man are anything but intellectual equals. <laughs> Firstly, God is eternal. Man, not so much. Secondly, God made the entire universe out of nothing. Man can make nothing out of nothing. Isaiah explained it this way. The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. His understanding no one can fathom. There's no way to fully comprehend God, not as humans. 
Even the brightest of intellectuals have limited comprehension when it comes to God. 1 Corinthians 1.25, for the foolishness. If God had foolishness, which he doesn't, but if God had foolishness, it'd be wiser than man's wisdom. Okay, if you want me to believe that your God created the entire universe and that he sustains it all, then I'm going to have to have proof of that. I'm going to have to know how he did it. <laughs> Do you think <laughs> man could ever in a million years come to understand not only the way God operates, but the power by which God operates. Again, from 1 Corinthians 1, the weakness of God. God doesn't have any weakness, but if God had weakness, it would be stronger than man's strength. No matter how many years we live, how often we read and study the Bible, the full essence of God is going to remain a mystery to us, and we need to be okay with that. Now, it's not a stretch to say we can know God's heart, what he desires, what blesses him, etc. But it's more than a stretch to think we have a pretty good handle on the true essence of God, because we do not. See, Moses wanted God to identify himself so he could tell the Israelites who it was that sent him to rescue them from the hands of the Egyptians. And here's what God told him. All right, I'll tell you, I'll tell you who I am. He said, I am has sent me to you. Tell him that, Moses, and that'll be good enough. <laughs> the second form of the triune God is the man Jesus. He's the Christ, the one true Messiah, and he is God. This form of God is known as the Son of God. What does the phrase Son of God actually mean? Think you ever think about that? <laughs> Does it mean that God the Father literally had a son? Well, the answer to that is obviously no. The phrase son of doesn't mean that someone literally has to be born from someone else. In fact, around the Greek New Testament times and when the New Testament was written, Caesar wanted to be referred to as the son of God himself. What that phrase literally meant was the nature of. Caesar was attempting to express the nature of God. Obviously, he fell way short, as any mortal would. So when you read the phrase son of in Scripture, you'll see that it refers to a person's nature. In Acts 4, Barnabas is called the son of encouragement. It's because the nature of encouragement is seen in Barnabas. James and John in Mark 3 are called the sons of thunder because the nature of thunder is seen in James and John. Judas is referred to as the son of perdition. This means the nature of hell was seen in Judas. So when Jesus is referred to as the son of, it's not a reference to him being born from the Father. It's actually a claim of his deity. Look at Colossians. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And then again in Colossians, the son is the image of the invisible God. The phrase Son of God refers to Jesus' nature as God. In John 3.18, Jesus tells us that he is the only begotten Son of God. This phrase, only begotten, is a claim against the Caesars of the day who attempted to themselves claim deity. Only begotten is saying that Jesus is the only one that possesses God's nature in him. It is the uniqueness of Christ. Only begotten translates as monogenes. It's mono, meaning the one, and genes, the word, where we get the word gene, meaning the only one of its kind. That's who Christ is. John 1, 1 and 14 tells us, in the beginning was the word. In the beginning was the Word, Jesus being the Word, we know that. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in verse 14, the Word, God, became flesh and dwelt among us. The phrase Son of God does not mean that God the Father has a kid. What it means is that Jesus himself is God in the flesh. The Old Testament is full of God giving prophets prophetic messages to his people. But so many dismiss these prophets because what God gave them to tell the people, those are difficult things to, to, to really receive. 
Often God challenged the hearts of men through these prophets. God was calling the people to repentance and to return to him. The people were stubborn. They refused. So God said, I'll go there myself, and I'll call them personally to myself. So he wrapped his existence in human flesh and came into the world to call all people to himself. That's what God did. Read the parable of the tenants in Matthew 21. It's Jesus explaining this plan of God. And that plan of God includes God showing mankind firsthand exactly who he is. And through the Christ coming, mankind discovers many things they didn't know about God, this distant God that they worship. First of all, they found out through Jesus that God desires relationships. God desires intimacy in these relationships. They found out that God is compassionate. He's merciful. God is long-suffering. God loves mankind unconditionally. They found that out. God is an emotional God, but God is also a God of righteous indignation. They found that out. All of these and more were written as evidence of God in Christ, who was in every way the essence of God on earth. Any question about that is answered by both Thomas and Jesus himself. First Christ, Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. And then when Jesus challenged Thomas to touch his wounds, Thomas came to this realization. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. What I find interesting is the name Jesus gave himself time and again throughout Scripture, called himself the Son of Man, right? I always thought that Jesus did that to kind of demonstrate uh, humility, confessing that he was a little less than God. But I I don't believe that any longer. How could he be less than God if he is God, right? Mary was his mother, and she was a member of mankind. So because of that, Jesus was made in the nature of man, son of man. Physically, he was the son of man. However, his very essence remained the nature of God. Now, if you've got a couple hours, I do. Explain that to me, will you please? Christ is 100% God and 100% man. i I got to come to understand that. No, I don't. No, no, I don't. I just got to accept it, right? Philippians 2.5 says this, Christ Jesus being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. He was the son of God, the nature of God, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, the likeness of a human, the son of man. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death on a cross. (laughs) Now, he had to do that, but obviously God could not die. God could not, as God, just die die on a cross, so God entered flesh, and then that flesh hung on a cross, sacrificing that life for the sins of mankind. It's remarkable, isn't it? I mean, just to think about that. God, in essence, chose to go to that cross on Calvary's hill so that you and I and all of mankind needn't go through the sentence that our sins deserve. That realization that God would love us that much to go to that length to save us is astonishing and very humbling. Okay, so God in his infinite foresight knew he was coming to earth with a mission or missions to personally call all people to himself and give the world an idea really of who their creator was and ultimately to then offer himself as a sacrifice to the world. And once that happened, and Jesus was crucified, God then put in motion the next and final step of communing with his people here on earth. Jesus was the one who prepared the people for this next step and what it was going to look like. He told them this, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him. Because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you, 
You know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. The counselor, the Holy Spirit will teach you all things. Hmm. Okay, so Jesus demonstrated what it looked like for God's essence to dwell in flesh. One of the reasons that he came. Now he's informing the people that this same Holy Spirit, in essence God, because God is spirit, was coming to dwell within the flesh of all who by faith believed in him. Acts 1, 4 and 8. Do not leave Jerusalem. This is Jesus talking. But wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Remarkable. Is that not? This is when the mantle got passed, brothers and sisters. What God did himself under the old covenant by visiting and communing with and empowering his people to overcome and carry forth his message of eternal life and hope What Jesus did by coming into this world and demonstrating for all the world to see that God still desires all people to to humble themselves and lay down their lives in an effort to receive their lives eternal, God has now given that responsibility to us. That if there was, I was thinking if there was a third testament, you got the old, the new, and a third testament in the Bible, it would be filled with among so many things, our names. It would be filled with this church, this fellowship. Paul would send greetings to those who fellowship at Church of the Rock and teaching young Pastor Nick and Mark how to do this and that. And That's exactly what it would be like because that's who we, we are in Him. Do you view the Holy Spirit and your role in this 4,000-year-old story of love that way? Do you view yourself that way? That God himself, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, is dwelling right here, right now, within your very presence. That his Holy Spirit is in you. That you didn't receive some subordinate spirit or maybe an angel or something or a a small piece of God divided among all the millions of of his followers. No, Uh uh-uh. It's God himself. It's God himself. I'm going to allow that to sink in for just a second. He visited Abram, called him, used him to bring about a nation of his people, God's people, Isaac and Jacob and Joseph always kept him near so they could hear and obey. Moses, God came to him and spoke with him and then delivered him. Joshua was called to usher God's people into the promised land. Samuel and David and Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, all the prophets, God never abandoned them. He kept them close, empowered them in mighty ways. He did that so that the world would know that there is one true God. Yehovah, Elohim, the great I am, and that he is their only God, and that he is the eternal God, the almighty God, the saving God. He came forth boldly yet humbly in the form of a human child so that the world would know that God was still alive and still calling and caring for his people. He came to reveal his holy essence in this immoral, unsacred, and profane world infiltrated by sin. That's when light came into the darkness. Jesus was God's way of demonstrating that love, his agape, unconditional love, was capable of anything. Now the same God has continued to exist on this God-forsaken planet, only he's chosen us you and me to be his witness, to be his voice to the world, a world that is blind, a world that is unaware that they are doomed without him. He has come to his people so that we can let the world know that there is hope so that we will preach and we will teach and we will tell those who are spiritually lost that there is an eternal God Almighty who is still and forever on the heavenly throne 
desiring all people to repent and come to him so that he can do what he's always done, and that is to deliver his people into the eternal promised land. And he doesn't expect us to do this on our own. God is aware that man is totally incapable of carrying forth this message alone. That's why he has given us himself. His full essence of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2.12 We have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit is from God that we may understand what he has freely given us. God has never abandoned his people, not once, never will. He came multiple times in multiple forms to reassure his people that he indeed remains present, communing and caring for and watching over all of us. Jesus came and demonstrated in the flesh firsthand what the true essence of God looked like in flesh, lived like, loved like, spoke like. Jesus demonstrated incredible power, amazing forgiveness, remarkable patience, and dealt with the best of the best and the worst of the worst with equal mercy and grace. That's who God is. And that message must continue to be taught and witnessed. And we're called to be the ones. If I'm God, I'm choosing anybody but mankind, right? We're to show the world that God still exists. We're to do that by living our transformed lives holy and righteous. Separating ourselves from the ways of the world. We do that living by a separate set of standards. By living in a freedom that can only be found in Christ Jesus alone. The truth is, for many people, we are the only evidence that God exists. We aren't doing that alone. Mm -mm. John wrote, the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. And Paul to Timothy, for God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. Would you pray with me? God, you are remarkable. With infinite wisdom, we still can't comprehend you. But that's okay, Lord. Because we trust you. You have our backs. You have our fronts. You have everything. Lord. As long as we give you our lives, Father, we will be taken care of, not just today, but forevermore. Thank you. Thank you for showing us, Lord God, the vastness of your essence. It is very humbling when we come into the knowledge of who you are, Lord God even in a limited capacity. We pray for your continued protection individually and collectively. We pray for this nation that it would once again fall under your command, Lord God, that we would fall on our knees and our faces, Lord, repenting and returning to the one true God. May we, Lord God, continue to strengthen us, and may we be the ones to carry forth this mantle of who you are, that the world may get a glimpse of you through our lives so that people would com confess, repent, and come to a saving knowledge of Christ Jesus. We pray this now, humbly, in your son's name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah.